Harper. <laughs> this meeting is apparently being recorded. <laughs> um, so uh, he spent most of his life in the New England area, um, having been born in 1882 in New York and passing away in 1967 in Manhattan. He's primarily considered a painter, though he was also an established printmaker, illustrator, and watercolorist. Hopper studied in New York at the New York School of Art and Design, which later became Parsons School of Design from 1900 to 1906. He then made three lengthy European trips following school, primarily staying in France and looking at French Impressionist work, and often cites Goya, Manet, and Degas as influential in his own artistic practice. To support himself for 15 years while the American art market was um, attention was on abstract painting, Hopper worked for a commercial art, worked as a commercial artist and illustrator for an ad agency to support, to support himself and his wife. Between 1950 and 1923, Hopper experimented with printmaking, producing 86 or 68 etchings and dry points. Unable to paint as much as he wanted during this time, printmaking allowed Hopper to develop his style of direct vision and truthful American themes, which he later worked into his oil paintings. By the 1920s, Hopper began to receive recognition for his works. From 1923 onward, his reputation grew. From 1924 to a few years before his death, he spent almost every summer in Cape Cod with his wife, Josephine who was an artist in her own right. When he first arrived in Cape Cod, he explored by foot and sketched lighthouses, Victorian homes, and other isolated architecture. In 1927, Hopper bought a car, which allowed him to travel extensively across America and paint along the way. The old Dodge acted as a mobile studio when the weather turned. He even paid a good sum of money to have the tinted windows removed so that he could see the true colors of the landscape. He painted in places such as Maine, Vermont, South Carolina, and even as far away as New Mexico. Though his most well-known works are primarily from Northeast in Jersey, Cape Cod, and New York. Hopper is characterized by many art historians as belonging to the American Realists, a movement in the 19th century highlighting social realities and the lives of everyday activities of ordinary people. He addresses themes of alienation and isolation typical of 20th century existence, as well as the loneliness and mediocrity of man's handiwork in nature's setting. Hopper's works exemplify American realist skilled manipulation of light and shade to create a sense of starkness and richness in color. This contributes to the haunting mood indicative of his work. The subjects of Hopper's pieces are often harshly lit. He aimed to capture sunlight and its effect on the surrounding environments rather than a particular subject. Hopper also heightened dr dramatic tension by using confrontational or unusual angles, looking down or looking up, and includes multiple points of view, which often shows more area than the human eye could absorb from one position. For this reason, his works are noted as possessing a cinematic quality as they do not report an actual event in the world, but rather restage a reimagined event in a narrative pictorial, in narrative pictorial terms using striking lighting, a cropped composition, and the overwhelming sense of silence and estrangement in his subjects. Hopper said of his works that he hoped they will not lead to any obvious on antidote, for sure. none is intended. Hopper works Hopper's works capture a universally relatable mood, which surpasses the um, American Jerry portions Epstein called when you were on the phone with Audrey. Of so you called him back. American realism. Well, he just called about 10 minutes ago. Can we make sure everybody's muted, please? <laughs> Someone's is? not on mute. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Hannah. I continue to add cat. <laughs> so moving on to the piece in our collection. Um, it's from the ABC Museum of Hopper. It's a Zoom. Can't see it. Do we know who it is? Okay, 
I guess I'll just continue on. <laughs> um, the piece we have in our collection is entitled House by Road. It was painted in 1942 in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. I'd like to walk you through the work visually quickly and just draw your attention to some details within our piece. The composition is made up of these horizontal bands of land, trees, sky, and the subject, which is this little white gray house that sits in a fluffy field of overgrown grasses. Nothing obscures the view of this house. The sky is a soft shade of grayish blue, hinting at perhaps a pre or post rain. Immediately, there's a sense of loneliness and solitude in the piece. The house displays many signs of a lack of occupation. Stark black voids in windows and doors draw the eye to the exact center of the piece. Some windows contain fluttering drapes indicating the presence of a breeze, but there is no evidence of humans or personal effects within the house. No outlines of furniture to indicate the presence of current inhabitation. This leaves the viewer asking who, if anyone lives inside, perhaps just the wind. The house is stark and lonely. Its Victorian details compete with the unwieldy wilderness surrounding its surrounding. It is evidence of it, it's evidence in little gusts of wind that sit in the swaying grasses and the spiral leaves on the right side bushes. Hopper stated that his aim in painting has always been the most exact transcription possible of the most intimate, intimate impressions of nature. Here are those intimate impressions of nature translate as wind and sunlight. Hopper's use of light contributes to the unyieldy, un underlying psychology, psychological tone of his works. The house evokes a sense of contemplation and mystery through the, the, through the depiction of undefined doors, blank open windows, and the austere facade. Hopper enjoyed Cape Cod and its many houses by roads as subjects, deeming the location and its contents salty, windswept, and lonely. This sense of loneliness is um, this sense of loneliness is in part why there has been a resurgence in Hopper in the last few months as people connect his works with the current affairs of COVID-19. The art world internet propagates memes stating, we are all in Edward Hopper paintings right now, coupled with uncannily familiar images like office in a small city. <laughs> Distanced from each other, sitting at our lonely windows overlooking an eerily empty city, like a woman perched on her bed in morning sun. Hopper's most common message is that modern life can be very lonely. His people are as isolated among others in a diner or a restaurant as they are in their apartment or windows. Hopper's most popular work, Nighthawks, encapsulates urban loneliness amongst others. The feeling of being unable to connect despite being surrounded by millions of others. The feeling of um, loneliness can arise in situations of proximity just as easily as it can when one is physically singular. It occurs <clears throat> when specific individuals' requirements for intimacy, connection, and closeness go unmet. New York Times author Olivia Lang stated in an article about Hopper and the current condition, that the reasons that the current crisis is so frightening is that it sets off fear, not just of being in quarantine, but also of being abandoned altogether. The nightmare of the social animal. This is what lies behind those empty cities in science fiction films. The terror of being the last one left. Patrolling deserted grocery aisles, the resources running out, no one left to love. A few people have sent me articles since social dis distancing began entitled something along the lines of, what you're feeling is grief. During this time of separation, we have lost our lives as we used to understand them. And with that loss comes grief. Psychologist Michael J. Formicha says, that undefi undefiable sense of angst, that cloying claustrophobia gripping your heart in the small of the night, that amorphous anxiety haunting your days, grief. You have lost something. Only you know what that is for you, but it is gone and you're grieving it. To move to the bright side. <laughs> we can learn a few things from Hopper during this incredibly bizarre time of social distancing. Firstly, solidarity. As we look at artworks like Cape Cod Morning, we relate to this figure standing in the window. 
perhaps we feel a bit trapped at the mercy of the pandemic over which we have little control. The comfort here is that we're all doing the same thing. And, what, and, <clears throat> and the more often images like Cape Cod morning gets shared on social media, the more we realize we're all in the same boat, all looking out our windows or sitting on a bed or anxiously scrolling through our feeds. We are somewhere in the world worrying about the future, stressing about work or just plain bored. Lang goes on in her article to say that the feeling is that this feeling is profoundly isolating to experience, and yet it's also a point of contention of connection with billions of strangers. One of the hardest things to grasp about loneliness is that it's a shared state inhabited by a multitude at a time. Ultimately, whatever you're experiencing right now, you are not alone. Solidarity. Secondly, stillness. Another reason why Hopper is a celebrated artist is that his work embodies tranquility, quiet, and stillness. We are in an age very recently defined by burnout culture, fast-paced, immediate gratification, speed over quality. But we have been forced to slow down and sit still for a minute by some rather harmful and aggressive microbe. Con coincidentally, this coronavirus period echoes the turbulent time that Hopper lived through, including two world, war, two world wars, the Spanish flu in 1918, the quick and often frivolous energy of 1920s culture, the sharp economic decline brought on by the Great Depression in the 1930s. Hopper's world was no less frightening and uncertain than our own. We can take this time to sit on our beds like Josephine here, to read a book, listen to a talk, stare out the window, think, breathe, and be still. Third, and finally, reconnection. We now have the opportunity, we have the opportunity now for a different kind of connection. Art is healing and provides many opportunities for that connection. Listening to music, viewing works online, reading books and poetry has the almost magical capacity of connecting us to something else. We feel seen and understood when looking at Hopper's works because yeah, we are kind of all in a Hopper right now. Although we may feel restless or even useless sitting at home, unable to control the little germ taking over our world, we can see comfort in the solidarity, the stillness and the connection imparted upon us. I encourage you to take a moment today to look out your window like you're in a hopper. Notice the air rustling the leaves, the way the sun hits the buildings, the color of the sky. Read a book, write a story, look at art, and seek comfort in your interior spaces. Oh, and wash your hands. Thank you all so much for listening. Should we go into questions? Yes, thank you so much, Hannah. I think that's very um, relevant to what's going on. You did a really great job. Thank you so much. And so, yes, we're going to open it up to questions. If everybody can see on their Zoom, the lower left-hand corner of your screen should have a, a microphone that says either mute or unmute. If it says you click it and you will have capacity to speak. <laughs> You can also turn on your videos if you'd like. So if you have a question for Hannah, I encourage you to share now. Um, so we'll have that open for about five to 10 minutes. So yeah, let's get some questions going. <laughs> Matt, I'm gonna have you ask a question. <laughs> I haven't really gathered. I thought, first of all, I just have a reflection. I just, um, yeah, thank you for um, including the current sort of climate around we're all in a hopper. I just sort of was stuck um, at that invitation to be still and in solidarity um, and to sort of look out <laughs> um, or to kind of imagine myself like in, in that kind of solitude. Um, I guess that Gratitude is leading to the question, um, what is your kind of personal hopper, Hannah? <laughs> um, 
would that be, I mean, where do you go to find that kind of contemplation or reflection, um, sort of channeling that Hopper-esque um, spirit? Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. And I love, um, I love the idea of connecting it back to myself um, because it's sort of, the talk comes out of a, a, a place of um, a little bit of that art historian notion, but also it is personal. It's definitely a, a personal topic. Um, for me, my uh, place of stillness and contemplation right now is like many people just being in their homes. Um, I think with us being in Arizona, we have the amazing pleasure of having wonderful weather. So I've been sitting out on my balcony a lot with my cat. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, just even when I was working on this and writing this, I um, found a lot of parallels between looking at a, a hopper or, or just any artwork really and realizing that a, a lot of art is really just about a, a certain way of looking at the world and um, kind of being able to do that same thing, you know, on, on your balcony and notice the shadows that are made by the wind rustling through the trees. And, um, you know, like I mentioned the color of the sky today, I, I always look at um, a little square of, of my sky and kind of think about James Terrell, um, if any of you are familiar with his work. So there's definitely a lot of connections between art and, and what's around us right now. And, and it's important to just kind of notice those little things, those little moments, um, the little shimmers of beauty, so. I have another follow-up question, unless someone will have another question. <laughs> Go for it. Um, so I work with Hannah, so I have a little familiarity of um, what your research entails. Um, and Hannah works on um, nostalgia and as it's represented in art. Um, and I, I, I like the quality of her writing is so affective. Um, it feels like it has this quality of sincerity. I'm just wondering if you can kind of talk more about if you've thought of Edward Hopper in this context of nostalgia as you've been researching it, and if you can sort of define how you think of nostalgia. Oh, I'm not unmuted. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, no, I, um, I think that's a great thing to point out. Um, I think Hopper is in a really, uh, unique position. <laughs> he is really well known and re well recognized. I'm sure almost everyone has seen Nighthawks at some point in their life. Um, oh, sorry. I just noticed that there's a chat also. <laughs> so we'll get to that in a second, I assume. Yes, Kat. <laughs> okay, great. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, my personal work does deal with nostalgia. Um, and that's what my thesis is, is about. Um, and I do find definitely connections with Hopper and sort of that romanticized look um, at the world, which is in, embedded in a lot of art that is primarily nostalgic. It's um, Kind of an idealized view and also just with Hopper um, he was incredibly influential to a lot of different um, filmmakers and writers um, I think of like Alfred Hitchcock is probably one of the quickest ones for me is um, just the idea of even like the rear window is such an obvious like hit over the head like <laughs> looking out your window like in a Hopper painting so um, I, th I think of that as well as the kind of nostalgic Im um, impact he had on things that we consider implicitly American or like these Americana pieces, um, like an Alfred Hitchcock movie, for example. All right, so Bobby had the question for everybody. If you haven't found the chat yet, he asked, uh, which Hopper pieces does the ASU Art Museum have in its collection? We have the one Hannah presented on. Uh, pride and joy a gem of our collection and then Brittany just asked you Hannah what is your favorite hopper um that is a great question um let's see if I can share my screen one more time because it was in the powerpoint <laughs> um
Oh, there we go. Okay. So I love this one in particular. Um, I think it exemplifies a lot of the things that I kind of talked about um, with his stylistic choices, um, these really intense areas of light, um, a really widened view that looks like it's in a movie. And I think that a lot of people can attach a narrative to this really quickly. I, I did an activity with kids um, at an older job with this piece and they came up with all different narratives for her and for what was going on in the movie theater and all different things. Um, but no one was ever the same. Um, and I think that's what's so lovely about this is that there's so many different interpretations and that's with a lot of his work, but I just like this one specifically. And Hannah, can you go back to the one that's in our collection just so yeah, everyone absolutely. has the visual? I'll get it a nice picture of it. So that's our hopper, everybody. <laughs> when we are back in the physical building, I expect everyone to come in and take a look. <laughs> are there any other question. questions? Yep. This is Jessica. So Hannah, <laughs> um, I know you've been doing a particular art and music challenge. So I wonder, is there a song that comes to mind that would maybe pair nicely with this hopper that you guys have in the ACC Art Museum? Oh, um, Jessica is my best friend from Texas, um, <laughs> for those who don't know. <laughs> and uh, yes, I have been doing an art music challenge on Instagram, which has been very fun. I encourage you all, if you're bored one day, to maybe think about your connection, um, think about a connection between art, visual art, and a, and a piece of music. It's a fun activity. Um, <laughs> the first thing that popped into my head, um, actually, with just Hopper in general and this talk in general is uh, Only Lonely on the Inside. Um, maybe we can all just sort of sing that to ourselves <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime. I had another question, Hannah. <laughs> Do you know how um, Hopper selects his sites and locations? It seems like there's always a figure and there's always some kind of architecture. So architecture is a really interesting aspect that um, I've never really thought too deeply about in terms of in Hopper. So do you happen to know anything about how, or even any of the images that you showed? Yeah, absolutely. That's such a great point. Um, I uh, did read quite a bit about um, not necessarily his figure selection. Um, his figure selection is is often, he, he uses his wife Josephine for almost every female in his work. Um, and then he does sort of model himself after um, a lot of the uh, unnamed businessmen um, that are depicted in his work. So the figure is not necessarily ever vital. Um, the thing that inspires him most and was always influential and made him, um, like I said, stop along his walks in Cape Cod or um, think about doing that piece was the particular lighting that was associated. So um, like in that image with Josephine on the bed, the, the more indicative thing of that creation is not necessarily Josephine or where she was sitting. Um, in all likelihood, he told her to sit there. I'm, I'm not exactly sure about the particulars of that piece, but um, the, the important thing is the way the light was hitting. Um, and he thought the same thing of um, architecture as well. He has a really famous quote that I think is in our um, gallery guide in the museum um, that says he was most interested in um, he wasn't interested in, in the figure, he was interested in the way the light hit the side of the building. Um, so it's definitely very um, much based on that. And then he was definitely incredibly interested in architecture. He actually said he found people boring and easy to paint. And he found that it was much more difficult and challenging for him to paint an empty street than anything else. Um, so that's a, a really interesting um, switch is that, you know, especially with our piece, which doesn't have a figure in it, um, just that focus on architecture. Um, and often he cho chose his houses based on the architecture. So um, things that had interesting roof lines or um, 
complicated tiles that were differently colored, like those slate tiles. That's what really drew him um, more so than anything else. It looks like we have two questions in the chat, Hannah, if you could take a look. Okay. One from Sierra and one from Bobby. The lack of racial, di I'll read them off. Can everyone see the chat? I'll just read them off anyways. <laughs> the lack of racial diversity in Hopper's paintings. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, I'm curious as to information on why this is, um, conjecture. Yeah. Um, you know, I haven't read much into this, admittedly, and probably, oops, I accidentally unmuted myself. I haven't read too much into this, um, but I would venture to say <laughs> that it is very indicative of the time. Um, the art world from 1900 to 1960 was incredibly whitewashed and dominated by men. Um, we don't hear a lot anymore at all about Josephine, his wife, but she was a very accomplished artist in her time as well. So, um, you know, white women also um, were sort of on the scene, but not, not as prevalent as people um, who, were, who were white men. So I think that's probably the main thing. And uh, like I said, he, he used a lot of himself and his wife um, in his work. So I don't know that um, there was ever really any thought to, you know, trying to include racial diversity um, just from a selfish standpoint of he and his wife were there to paint. <laughs> um, and then Bobby asked what, per, um, what, <laughs> um, what, oh, Hopper's rights to fame. So yeah, um, I think that one of the main changes is uh, just that, that transition around 1920 in the art world and the New York art scene, um, moving from what would have been very abstract uh, World War I era art into um, the move would have been quickly into precisionism. So that's when we see the rise of people um, like Charles Sheeler, if you're familiar with his work, but these very angular pieces, um, in particular looking at uh, industry and uh, architecture as well, city architecture. Um, and I think Hopper just kind of wiggled his way in there. He uh, started to sort of just fit right in with uh, the um, American realists. And I, I think the contribution as well to his rise in fame is that kind of universality in his works, the ability to attach your own story um, or really any story to a lot of pieces um, and, and sort of that uh, common feeling of um, relatability. I think we have time for one more question. Hannah, what's your mom's name? Amy. <laughs> All right, Amy, I'm calling you out. Do you have any questions for Hannah? No? All right, what about Angelica? Sorry, oh. I was, I was, I was, oh, okay. you, but she was <laughs> muted. <laughs> questions, Amy. Yes. Let's see, question for Hannah. Um, Let's see, where is the majority of the hoppers located? Where, like, is there a certain, like, a, is it at a American Art Museum, like the Crystal Bridges, or where, where is most of his works? Yeah, so um, I think his most popular piece um, is Nighthawks is in uh, the Art Institute in Chicago. And then there are, a, a, a <laughs> A lot of museums uh, have a hopper. Um, uh, most museums are going to sort of have something of his if they have a collection on American art. Um, I remember when I started working uh, at the ASU Art Museum, I was surprised that we had a hopper. And then I don't remember who it was I was talking to in the museum, but somebody had said that there was a, um, some news reporter I think from NPR was traveling across the country and 
in every museum he went in, he asked to see their hopper. So almost every museum has some little hopper tucked away in a corner somewhere. Um, the most well-known ones, I think, are in Chicago and New York, um, which is not unsurprising. That's, you know, a common, <laughs> a common place for uh, really popular art to live. <laughs> All right. Well, once again, Hannah, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining. This was our first Zoom. I think it went well. <laughs> We're going to have another Masterpiece at Midday this Thursday, same time. There's a different Zoom link that you can find on our social medias um, or our website. And so we really hope you join us for that one. It's with Peter Held, who used to be the curator of ceramics at the Ceramics Research Center for the ASU Art Museum. And he's going to be talking about Toshiko, who is, was a ceramicist uh, who is known for her closed form shapes that she made. But Hannah, I just want to say you did a fantastic job. Thank you so much for being our guinea pig. Super of proud of you. <laughs> and thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, we hope to see you on Zoom, on our social medias, and back in the museum space when we get there. Have a good day, thank everyone. Thank you guys so much. Have a good day.